resurrection and life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and shall I see God whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we cannot carry, we can carry nothing out. The Lord God gave, and the Lord God hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sunrise, April 13th, 1967. Sunset, March 8, 2024. We're here to celebrate the life of our dear brother, Savory Boyer. We're going to follow the program the family laid out, beginning with opening prayer, followed by scripture reading. This time, of Brother Reginald Herndon would come forth, provide our opening prayer, and then the scripture reading by Brother Edouard Dufresne. Shall the audience please stand? Dear merciful God, we come in the precious name of Jesus Christ. A celebration, Heavenly Father, dear God, of life, not death. We thank you, Heavenly Father, dear God. These earthen vessels, Heavenly Father, will perish but we can have everlasting life. 
We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our brother Borier, Heavenly Father, how he lived, Heavenly Father, how he inspired us, Heavenly Father. Lord, his family, dear God, we appreciate his children, his wife, dear God, their dedication, Heavenly Father, in times of trouble and adversity, Heavenly Father. They stood as a family, dear God, Lord, commemorating the power of God, Heavenly Father. Lord, you shine down on every one of them, Heavenly Father. And they stood, Heavenly Father, when he needed them most in the name of Jesus Christ, we're so thankful, Heavenly Father. Lord, to be a part of these families, Heavenly Father. Thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God. We're celebrating, Heavenly Father. Not mourning, dear God. He made it, Heavenly Father, to heaven, Heavenly Father. And we're fighting to get there, Heavenly Father. Help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless, Heavenly Father, every word that is said, Heavenly Father. Comfort hearts, comfort minds. We believe God in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 22 from verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, for the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and the last. Praise God. God bless you.
not in vain. Thank the Lord. This time we have selected remarks by Sister Creta, Brother Carl Caton, Brother Edward Dufran, Brother Darian Mayhu, and Brother Reginald Herndon. So if you all would come, the family gave very specific orders. Please keep it to two minutes or under and just sit over here in the chairs and just go one after another. So those speakers, if you would met mine, making it to that corner, that microphone right there. And Sister Credit, since you're right there, praise the Lord, you can lead us out. Amen. I'm so thankful to be here and so honored to be asked to speak in behalf of Brother Savory Boyer, very, very good friend of mine. So faithful, as many have said, Brother Boyer lived his own testimony. He lived his own obituary. He was just a faithful saint of God, wonderful father, wonderful husband. He was just all you could ask for, My Lord. bottled up in a man. My Lord. I don't know how they come up with this two-minute thing, how you're going to talk about 20 years in two minutes. But anyway, we'll do the best we can because Brother Boyer meant so much to me and his children. You know how you meet some people, they just become like family, you know, just automatic. Just, you just bond. There's just something about it. Sister Cynthia, beautiful woman, wonderful wife. She and her husband were a team. They stood together. She was right there with him on every situation. Whenever Brother Boyer was sick, she'd call right there to pray with him Man. on many settings. Man. And Brother, God would raise him up. Amen. Brother Boyer was a man of faith. He believed God. He had situations. He had setbacks. He had all kinds of things going on. But Brother Boyer never hung his head in defeat. He came forth with the victory every time he had a situation. I remember there was one time he had a, a building on his property. And they were in, uh, forcing him to tear it down. Well, he didn't have a wherewithal to tear down a concrete building. And, and Brother Boyer told me about it. We talked and we prayed. And what? A man came and said, I'll tear it down for you. Lord. That's through faith. Brother Boyer believed God. He believed God. And then there were times, just not here long ago, he needed a roof on his house. He said, Sister Credit. <coughs> I need a roof. I said, okay, brother, brother we're going to pray about it. We prayed. And you know what? They come told brother, brother, you can have a roof. We're not going to charge you a dime. That's the kind of stuff brother boy you prayed through. He stood for God. He believed God. He had a contact with God. He was a man of God and a wonderful friend. And I love him so dearly. And I'm going to miss him. Children, we're going to miss him. He's gone, but we're going to miss him. Sorely. But you know what? The last week of Brother Boyer's life was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. Brother Boyer fell sick. Sister Boyer called and I'll meet you. We met there at the hospital. And Sister Boyer stood like a rock. She knew what her husband wanted. But you know, the medical field, they do what they do. They do what they do. But it wasn't long. Brother Boyer woke up and was speaking and talking and telling his family how much he loved them, told us all how much we loved us. He gave us commissions, told us what we ought to be doing. And I thank God for that. That brother, in the face of death, he just woke up and began to tell his children, commanding them, you this, you that, and all. I'm telling you, he left a message for Brother, brother Lee. <laughs> I ain't told you about it yet, but he, he, he left a message for you. <laughs> but that was Brother Boyer. That was Brother Boyer, the Brother Boyer I knew. He'd come by my house, fix my car, stayed all day. Couldn't get it fixed, but I said, that's all right, Brother Boyer. We are not going to worry about it. And, but he stayed as long as he could. That's just how determined he was. And he was determined in his salvation. 
But there's one thing y'all don't know about Brother Boya. Brother Boya was a doctor. He delivered one of his children. <laughs> yes, he did. I was right there. But at last week, that brother, oh, it was so glorious. I, I, it's hard to explain it. You'd have had to witness it. You'd have had to be there. But the very last day, Brother Boya wanted to go home. He was ready for heaven. He, he talked about it. He was ready to go. But that last day, he told his wife I want to go home. To his own home, to his house. They got him ready, took him home, and Brother Sister Boy called and said, so and so and so and so. I said, I'll be right there. Went there, and look, Brother Boy looked so peaceful. They had fixed him up, all these pillars and things all around him. He's so comfortable. Brother Boy, he was about ready to get out of his children. And do you know what? We sat there and watched him. He took about four or five deep breaths. And every time in between was 40 seconds or so. And we were like, oh, is that the last one? It wasn't it. I said, come on, brother. He gives one more. Give us one more, brother. One more. He'd give us one more. But pretty soon he gave one more. And that was it. God had come and got him. The angels come and got him and took him on home. My Lord. What a glorious sight. What a glorious moment to see him take his last breath. Oh, it was so wonderful. It was so wonderful. I tell you, every time I think about it, it just brings a chill over me almost. My Lord. Because it was a glorious sight to see a saint go on home. Amen. I mean, one that fought the battle through without wavering, could not spot his life. My Lord. Say what you want to say. He couldn't Amen. spot his life. Amen. He was Amen. a man of God. Amen. Good husband, Sister Boya. Amen. Cynthia stood by her husband. She was there with her husband. Crisis, whatever. My Lord. Xavier, Alexandria, Christina, Sarah, Tyler. You got some heavy shoes, brother. You got some heavy shoes to feel. He was truly a man of God. But he was so proud of you. He would talk about you every now and then. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> oh, I love Brother Boya. We, we were friends. We were friends. I mean, a lot of people don't know your, con your connection with people. But Brother Boya, eh, see how he affected people. Look at all these people here. Look at all these people. Well, two minutes is up. <laughs> Now, Sister Credit, you had 20 years. Now, Darren, he's got more than that, but he got to be limited to two minutes, too. <laughs> Brother Catone is like a father. He's got to be limited to two minutes, too. Brother Eddie, he goes back to when they was driving 280Zs and stuff. Brother Eddie, where you at <laughs> with your BMWs and stuff? They go back. But the family has a tribute, and they got to be at the funeral home or the graveyard at a certain time unless they're going to pay extra. So if you make this family late, late, we're going to take a collection up for Sister Cynthia. <laughs> if I start playing the piano, that just means two minutes. Please be respectful. There's no way you can say it all. And we probably won't remember everything you say. <laughs> this man, you all know him like I don't know him. But I know certain things about him that I know about him. That might not make any sense to you. But I know him in suffering. The most of what I know about this man is in suffering. His sufferings. He, the Lord permitted me to have an influence in his life in his moments of deep suffering. That's where I know the grit that was in him. That's what I know about him. A man suffering, clamoring, God have mercy, work on me, do me a blessing. That's what I know about him. And I noticed that in those moments, he was ready to follow instruction. I don't know about anything else, but I know the man under that condition, in that environment. And it gave me a place in his life, as I told you the other night, like a father in his life. And I, I will say this. This man, you can still look at him through his life. 
People will look at him through the life of his children. I'm, I'm challenging you all, his children, and his wife also. Play it strong in God's hand. Magnify the Lord through your lives. Uh, and I will say this and mo- sit down. When, Joshua di- uh, when Moses died, God said, Joshua, you step up. And just like that, many times down through the Bible history, there were men who came to replace another one. You all are here to live a legacy of faith and hope as deep as you know it to be. Live it to the hilt and glorify God. Brother Savory and I were, we had gotten connected very early um, after they'd gotten saved. This, uh, the boys lived upstairs. We still lived in the same home, and I lived downstairs. We shared many like experiences. We had gotten even closer um, during the time of his sickness, and when we heard it, we took on an instant burden We do appreciate his life, appreciate the closeness that we had together. Uh, There are times in New York we used to pray and talk about marriage. Uh, Since since the the message used to come very frequently on marriage, and we should break down the scriptures together, Uh, we had gotten very, very close. Uh, One thing we had in common was working on cars. Uh, We used to talk about fast cars and hot rods and as the brother just mentioned, to ADZ, I remember driving him to zipping through traffic on the Belt Parkway and, and, and making the wheels chirp every, every time and driving him to his high school graduation. And here we are zipping and out of traffic and, and having a good time as two young men together. We had such wonderful times together. Um, we, I do appreciate the love of God, how we had gotten close together. I tell you, had it not been for the love of God, we would not have gotten this close. I really appreciate his wife. He used to say, oh, we used to talk to each other. And we used to thank God for our wives. I thank God for my wife. Thank God for my wife. And, and Sister Cynthia, stay strong. Um, he used to speak very highly of you. Uh, one thing I want to say, though, living in the same home, and they were upstairs, and I had never told Sister Cynthia this, but after she had moved, because her family was expanding, was growing, and uh, I decided to move upstairs after they had left. And there were times she would call me. She said, it was freezing up. I said, please go downstairs and crank up the thermostat. And then after they moved out, uh, and, and we moved upstairs, and it was so cold. I said, how did she do it? She never complained. Brother never Savior said, Brother Savior never complained. I never said this. I said, what a sweet spirit. What a sweet spirit. We watched them develop, watched them mature. Uh, I was a little old just a few years older than him, I do appreciate the marital experience and how well they, they, just, they just took on the message and lived the message, the husband and wife message were pounded with, the gospel message on, on holiness, the gospel message on unity, the gospel message, husband and wife taking up their roles in the, in, in the home, appreciate seeing it in real life, in the lives of, of Brother Savior and Sister Cynthia. Keep it down to two minutes. I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to hold. I'm going to stick to it, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Pastor, I'm going to keep my eye this way so I can see you. Because <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is not two minutes. So I met Sabri the second week of high school. And Sabri was heading home. And another friend of mine, Carl, and I were walking. And we saw him walking by himself. And Taz, Taz Savory used to get teased in school. And we're like, we're going to be friends with him. And we're walking home, walking home. The second, no, the third week of high school, he turned to me and said, I'm going to marry Cynthia. And I said, Cynthia who? He pointed out Cynthia to me in high school. I said, Savory, you 
you are going to have to work really, really hard <laughs> and get your A game up. He's like, I'm marrying Cynthia. Scroll forward, we're 16. We have no money, no money. And I'm gonna to explain to you how Sarah and I became bonded. We were so broke we couldn't even pay attention. <laughs> we used to buy one meal and he and I would share it. If I had a dollar, we shared that dollar. We couldn't even afford to go into the club. We used to borrow money to get to go into the club and we would have a good time and come home. And then later on, because I was ahead of him, I graduated and we were still hanging out and we'd go to parties and we'd go to clubs. But after that, I got to drop him by Cynthia. He's got to see his Cynthia. When we left and we moved and he followed me, he came down and we lived in Florida. And it so happened, we lived almost the same distance apart like we lived in New York. We would hang out and Sari loved to party. <laughs> and he had this one little dance and it never changed. No matter what beat it was, it never changed. <laughs> and we would party from New York all the way down. I had bought a car and we used to drag race. And Sabri and I used to drag race. Ah, nobody knew that. We were in Brooklyn one day. We used to set people up. I would drop Sabri off and he would look at their engines and he would tell me who to drag race against and who wouldn't. He said, Darren, you gotta hit you gotta hit third and hit fourth and go back in. And I was racing five hundred dollars and I did the gears wrong. And he came over and he blasted me. And he said, I wanna race him. I said, Sabri, you don't race for money. I wanna race him. I said, Savory, it's five hundred dollars. He said, I want to race him. I put up the five hundred dollars, Savory blew him away. <laughs> he said, That's how you drive your car. That's how you drive your car. I was doing I was I was doing four days, sixteen hour shifts, and my mom called me. And she was living in Florida, and I had to co-sign for her home. And she said, Darren, the closing, they moved it up. And I said, Mom, when is the closing? She said, tomorrow. I said, Mom, there's no way I can make it. Sabri looked at me and said, I'll drive you. I said, you got to go to work. I'm calling out. I got in the car. I threw some money on the dashboard. I closed my eyes. I went to sleep. About 1 o'clock in the morning, you know what it's that's like you're shifting, like a plane is going to slow down? That's the speed he was going at. I looked over, he's doing 130. <laughs> Got me there for the closing, we signed the paperwork, and we came on back. The definition of a friend is someone who you bonded with. I don't think that fits Savory. I think it's something more. So I looked up and I came up with unflappable, dependable. Non judgmental, thoughtful, resilient, supportive, loyal, respectful, trustworthy, humble. Humble. He, things didn't matter to him. Money didn't matter to him. Clothes didn't matter to him. Status didn't matter to him. Cynthia. His kids. You know, we were hanging out and we started to see how much he and I grew up the same. The same year he came from Haiti, I came from Jamaica. He's born the 13th, I'm born the 13th. We're born the same year. He has six kids, I have six kids. And he wanted me to move to Michigan. I said, sorry, I can't move here. It is just too cold. He said, come on, man, if you came here, you know, we could build houses together, renovate, because we, he, he used to help me um, renovate and construction and painting. He was sick one day, and he wanted to make some money to come back and see Cynthia. And I'm painting, and I'm painting, and I look over at him, and he's sweating. And I said, what's wrong? He said, Dave, I, I got to get this done. And I felt him. I said, dude, you're sick. I said, I got you. I dropped him home. I came back. I finished the job. I said, come on. Here's your money because he's got to go see Cynthia. 
that man loved you. Best friend ever. Thank you. We're speaking here on a higher acclivity. Uh, Brother Boyer, uh, I met him years ago when he came from Far Rockaway or New York. Um, I was so impressed with what he was telling me as far as what God had actually done for him and his wife and each of his children. Uh, so remarkable to have someone living a godly life, a godly standard, and God was working. Uh, Brother Kevin had mentioned last night uh, fasting seven days, uh, his children uh, for a financial need. Uh, it was seven times seven, that the different stories that I've heard. I've never seen someone who was graced with such faith, quite honestly. Um, but I did notice uh, over a period of time, uh, Brother Sabre had like a desire to eat. And that's where I came in kind of a situation where I was saying, Brother Sabre, uh, you can't eat all that. You, you, you can't continue to eat like that, you understand? There, there has to be some discipline. Uh, and I would talk to him about that. Um, but the discipline that he put himself under, he put his whole family under. He, he had his whole family walking, uh, his daughters, his son, his wife, to maintain uh, a balance in their life. We're, as Christians, we don't just give ourselves to anything except God. And so he began to discipline himself. The discipline was not because I said it, but because God troubled him about what I said. And the beauty of it is the fact that when it came time to die, when it came time to die, Brother Warrior was becoming sick. He was becoming uh, there was his heart. Uh, he called me about the palpitations that he had one time, and he was very concerned. He was working in Ann Arbor, and he called me, and I said, Brother Boyer, I said, you told me about faith, and now we have to pray, and you've got to believe that God can heal that, can touch your body. Brother Boyer believed God. That day, he called me later on, and he told me he was fine. We, his wife, my wife, and his children, each time they become sick, and I'm just being honest with you, it's no, it's no light matter that when you have to trust God and your body is aching, your, your head is hurting, and you're getting bad reports from doctors, uh, all three of the vital organs, we're talking about his heart, you understand? We're talking about his kidney, we're talking about even his head. The bad reports can move a person, they, that, that those reports can move a person. But with his family's help and support, we began to pray. We began to pray and believe God, that God was able to do whatever God can conduce. He can conduce a person. He can conduce a person to believe him, to hold on to him. And Brother Boyer did exactly that. The beauty of what I've seen in this family is that each of his children were the ones that encouraged him to go a little further. They said, Dad, you can go a little further. You can push a little harder. And that is exactly what he did. He believed God. This is divine healing. We have to be able to believe God for our bodies. Sickness may come upon a person. You understand that? Sickness may become upon anyone in here. 
but we're trusting God, and that's what he had to do, and he did it. The inspiration that I seen coming from his family is quite remarkable. Only God can do that. God graced him constitutionally. His body was failing. His body was failing, but his family's faith was not failing. They actually prayed him through. She called me on a Saturday, and he was in the hospital, unconscious. And as I looked down at him, I said, I said to myself as I looked at his daughters and his wife, I said, now, I know that God can do it. I know that he's not beyond the point of life. But do, does God want to do it? Does God want to do it? And I prayed, and they prayed also. And I heard the very next day that, again, Brother Sanabri was talking. Amen? Sabri, I'm sorry, Boyer was talking. And he was talking and he was speaking. And that encouraged my heart in such a great way. That encouraged my heart. And then I heard that he had passed. But I knew the encouragement that he got to want to be, to want to trust in God. That's what blessed my soul. That brother wanted to trust in God and God brought him through. I'm so inspired by his life. I'm so inspired by the many times I've sat with him and heard the wonderful stories. Even his wife had to trust God through situations and circumstances, and God raised her up every time. Even his son, whatever he got into, Brother Boy was able to give attention to it and call God down in that matter. It's a wonderful thing to live a holy life. And that's what we're doing. That's what it, that's, there's a price to live this way. It's not just trying to do something. You have to have God. You have to have real faith. In the darkest hour, in the darkest hour, you've got to be able to believe God and not tremble in it. You understand that? There was no trembling. You understand? And that's what it's all about. God bless you. Is there anybody out there who would like to trade places? <laughs> You're doing good. We're going to take a collection up for you if they charge you extra. All right. Now we have a musical selection, another soldier coming home. back is bent and weary, his voice is tired and low, his sword is worn from battle and his steps have gotten slow. But he used to walk on water, or it seems that way to me, I know he Strike up the man, assemble the choir.
Another warrior hears the call He's waited for so soldiers coming home He faced the wind of sorrow but his heart knew no retreat He walked in narrow places knowing Christ knew no defeat But now Closer to the prize He's sounding kind of voices There's a longing in his eyes Strike up the band Assemble the choir The warrior hears the call, he's waited for so long. He'll battle no more, he's won his war. Make sure the table has room for at least one more. Sing a welcome song. Their soldiers coming home. Sing a welcome song because my father's coming home. Change the lyrics, Tyler. Go ahead on. Amen. Well done. This time we have the obituary. Fader Boyer, brother. Boyer's brother. Brother Boyer's brother and half twin. Thank you. Savary Boyer was born in Lekai, Haiti, on April 13, 1967, to Jacques Abneo Boyer and Isalia Guillaume, who's sitting here. As a child, Savary was happy, was a happy soul who was always ready to make you smile. His jubilant personality enabled him to excel in many aspects of his life. He developed a love for trying new things and was often viewed as fearless and he embarked on a new, as he embarked on a new adventure. His early experiences in life helped, him shaped, helped shape him into the hardworking man he became. 
Savory immigrated to New York at the age of 15, where he attended Springfield Garden High School, despite facing the challenge of a language barrier. He never allowed this obstacle to deter him from achieving his goals. With unwavering determination and perseverance, he not only reached these goals, but also actively participated in various extracurricular activities while in, in high school. Savory later moved to Miami, Florida with his family and eventually earned a degree. His love for technology inspired him to start his first business where he built customized computer systems. He later started a courier service. He was most recently, he was most recently employed to, at Henry Ford Allegiance Health. Savory met the love of his life and best friend, Cynthia Simon, in high school in 1982. They were joined in holy matrimony in 1993. Out of this union came seven beautiful children, Isalia, Alexandria, Serena, Tyler, Christina, Justin, and Sarah. His wife and children were his pride and joy. He was a loving husband and a dedicated father. He was always trying to find ways to have fun and keep things exciting. Savory gave his life to the Lord as a young adult at the Church of God in Far Rockaway, New York, where he served as an usher and a choir member. He moved his family to Jackson, Michigan in 2001, where he attended the Church of God. He endeavored to please God in every aspect of his life. He looked to God in every situation he faced. One particular testimony he loved to share was about the gold coin. He loved to travel to various fellowship meetings to be with the people of God. Savory enjoyed fishing, traveling, photography, family gatherings, and working on cars. He was always willing to give a helping hand to those in need. He was a jack of all trade. He loved to spend time with his nieces and nephews. He especially loved when the young people would gather at his home. Savory made a lasting impact on many through his kindness, generosity, and genuine spirit. He touched the lives of many who knew him. His memory will be cherished by those who had the privilege of knowing him. Savory was preceded in death by his father, Jacques Abner Boyer, his son, Justin Nathaniel Boyer, and his granddaughter, Isabella Rene Warren. He leaves to cherish his memory, his loving wife of 30 years, Cynthia Boyer, and children, Isalia, Alexandria Warren, um, Serena, Tyler, Christina, Sarah, his mother, Isalia Guillaume, his brothers, Wagner, Fedor, that would be me, Gardy Boyer, Julio, his, his sister, Mar Mariange, um, father figure, Carl Caton, second mother, Coretta Sim Sisson, special niece, Hannah Moore, bonus daughters, Camilla Willis, Kiana Rodney, Kiona, Roni, Brittany, Riggins, Shalina, Gibson, Kamala, Childs, Candice, Riggins, and Sarah, Toutbon. Toutbon. Special sisters, Claude Boyer, Mirlaine, Joseph, and Bernice Henry. Special friends, Darren, Mar 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 Mayhew, Emmanuel, and Nancy St. Louis, Carl Charles, the Kowaleski family, the Dufresne's family, Reginald Herndon, Her Her Herndon, Larry Burke, Anissa Kas Gaskin, Levon Guerra, Sherry Sisson, Andre and Tiffany Simpson, Tatanisha Wor Worthy, Tiffany Williams, the Warren family, and the Burris family, anniversary twins, Eric and Janet Koblen and a host of aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, and friends. I would also like to take this opportunity on behalf of my family, the Boyer family, to thank every one of you who attended this service to today. 
Last night we were here and we heard many of you who shared the lives that Savary shared with you, the experiences that Savary shared with you. And I want you to know that we appreciate your words. We appreciate you and your courage to come up and share what you know, share the love that Savary shared with you. And by doing so, you will also help us heal in this moment. Thank you so much. Condolence. To the family and friends of Brother Savory Boyer, we would like to extend our heartfelt sympathy to you during this time of your loss. Brother Boyer was a special man of God in our midst. He was a faithful husband and devoted father to his family. He stood on the promises of God, often standing and giving his testimony of how God answered prayer for his family's physical and financial needs. He loved spending time with his family and the saints of God. It was not uncommon to see him working along with his wife during vacation Bible school and with the teenage boys working with their arts and crafts. Brother Boyer was a gentleman with great faith. We miss his warm smile and easygoing personality. And although we are sad, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope because he is in a better land. Brother Boyer is no longer suffering in his earthly body. He is now free from all pain and disease. He is free from life's troubles and sorrows. He is rejoicing with the many saints who have gone on before him to their reward. We appreciate his perseverance and steadfastness. Sister Cynthia and children, we are praying that the peace and comfort that only God can give will stay with you and be your abiding strength in the days ahead. Prayerfully, Pastor Lee Hampton and congregation. Condolence from the Arvine Church of God, 1318 Central Avenue, Far Rockaway, New York. To the family of Brother Savory Boyer, we extend our deepest condolences. We share the heartfelt sorrow as you mourn the passing of your dear brother and friend of our dear brother and friend. He is, he will be truly missed by all of us. He was always pleasant, joyful, respectful, loving, gentle, and kind. His loss deeply saddens us all. During this time of bereavement, may the God of all comfort bring you solace and strength. To Sister Cynthia and the children, and the entire family, may God provide you with the exact comfort needed to navigate through this difficult period. The void which you are now experiencing will take time to heal, but we certainly thank God for the precious memories we cherish together. You all are very dear to our hearts. We love and appreciate you all. Our thoughts and prayers are with you as you reflect on and celebrate the life of our dear brother, Savry Boyer. With heartfelt sympathy, Pastor Edward Dufrance and the congregation of Far Rockaway, New York. All other cards and condolences will be acknowledged at another time. Thank you. Thank you for both of those. This time we have a tribute from his nieces and nephews and his siblings, and then it'll conclude with his children. Turn it on, turn that mic on for me, turn it on.
<clears throat> Our uncle was a phenomenal man. He cared for us like his own. I'm gonna miss the many times he would call us and would wonder how we were or wonder where our whereabouts were. He would just talk and talk and talk and all we had to do was just listen. <laughs> or my uncle also had a sense of humor. He would crack these crazy corny jokes um, with my mom. My mom would crack jokes, he would crack jokes, and they'll just be dying laughing. And we'll just look at them and smile like, what? Um, I remember the end of last year, we as, I guess we as a family were going through something and he called and all he said was, Hannah, is this you? And then he just broke down crying. And we both lost it, like, but I think he just needed that outlet to be able to cry and not be judged. <laughs> um, and we both felt better after that and he was just like, I'm so sorry I had to do that. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay. We have to do that to get through. Um, there were times when he wanted the best for each of us as his nieces and nephews. He would, he wanted us to be at our full potential, whatever we was going through. He wanted us to be, he would open up his door. He was open and willing to open up his home in any kind of way for his nieces and nephews who needed support. He was the kind of dad, he, he was the kind of person who especially opened it up when, especially for my brothers, they, like he had that connection with them. Like he wanted to help them. He wanted to be at their full potential. If it was, hey, come stay with me, come live with me. That's what he did. He, he opened his, his home up many times and we're so grateful for that. Um, he made sure to take time out of his busy schedule in order to pr prioritize family, even if it meant driving the 15 hours to Georgia. For example, my surprise party, <clears throat> my mom's party last year, didn't have to do that. He wasn't feeling good. He came again in the middle of the year. Um, there was countless other times that he came and just supported us in whatever we had going on. I knew his time was nearing at the end when his, jo his jokes had stopped. He didn't say any jokes. Um, he kept saying, I want to rest, I want to rest. And I knew that he needed rest, but at the same time, I didn't want him to rest. Sorry. I didn't want to let go. I had to leave to another funeral and I left him and I said, bye, I'll miss you. He said, I'll miss you too. Uh, and then I got a call that he was gone. I'll miss my calls, I'll miss my late conversations. Just him caring, him not judging, him just listening, just listening us through, just listening us out. Just one of the best for us at all times. He's going to be missed. You may be gone, but your presence will ever be felt in each of our lives. Love you all.
Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. Je suis la tante de Savary. Je, I, je viens du Canada. I live in Canada. Je veux donner un, un dernier hommage à mon neveu. I want to say some last words to my nephew. Pour qui il était. Un petit garçon fugueux. And uh, for who, my nephew was a, a very happy young child. Curieux. Curious. Il voulait tout savoir. He wanted to know all. Dès son âge, son jeune âge, il attirait déjà tout le monde par son sourire. Um, from the very young, a very young age, um, everyone was attracted to him because of his smile. Et il a gardé ce sourire jusqu'à la fin. And he kept his smile all the way till the end. Devenu adulte. When he became il, an adult, il demeure courtois. He remained very courteous. Enchanté. Always happy. Il aimait la vie. He loved life. Quand il nous voit, <coughs> il reçoit tout le monde à bras ouverts. When he sees us, he always welcomes us with open arms. Il a toujours un mot gentil. He always has something very nice to say. Une histoire drôle à raconter. Always a weird story to tell. Avec tous ceux qui fréquentaient. With everyone he um, Il était became sociable. friends with. He was very social. Malgré la distance qui nous séparait. Um, in spite of the distance that separated us. Montréal à New York. From Montreal to New York. L'amour de tante et de neveu. The love of an aunt and a nephew. N'a jamais changé. Never changed. À chaque fois que je, qu se rencontre. Every time we got together. Il se mesurait à moi. He always stood next to me to see how en tall he was. En disant, en disant, oh ma tante. And he always said. À chaque said, fois, je te vois, tu deviens plus petite. Every time I see you, you become smaller and smaller. Et on rigolait. And we laughed together. Je considérais mon, Savary comme mon enfant. I considered Savary as my own child. Je l'aimais beaucoup. I loved him very much. Il était généreux he et was, attentionné. He was very generous. Je me rappelle deux jours avant son mariage. I remember two days before his wedding. Il était arrivé de Miami. He came from Miami. Avec une caisse de mangue sur ses bras. With a big box of mangoes under his arms. Pour m'apporter. To bring to Parce me. Parce qu'il savait que c'était le fruit que j'aimais le plus. Because he knew that it was the fruit that I loved the most. Parce que je sais. Il savait que je serais présent au mariage. He knew I was going to be there at the wedding. Il descend de la de la il sort de la de l'aéroport quand j'ai ouvert la porte, c'est la boîte de mangue qui était He came to moi. pick me up at the airport. When I came out of the airport, he sh he presented me with the big box of mangoes. Il venait toujours me visiter pendant un court séjour à New York. He always came to visit me whenever I was here in New York. Et un jour il m'a donné ce foulard. And it, one day he gave me this scarf that I'm wearing today. Chaque fois, chaque, depuis des années, j'ai gardé ce foulard précieusement. For many à years, I've kept this scarf very preciously. À chaque fois, je vais à New York. Every time I go to New York, je porte le foulard. I, I carry it with me. Et je le porte aujourd'hui. And today, I have it on today. On, on se voyait, on ne se voyait pas. Mais on changeait des vidéos. We didn't see each other often, but we often exchanged videos. Et on parlait par message texte. And we text through messaging. Après sa première hospitalisation, after he was first hospitalized, il m'a parlé deux heures. We talked for two deux hours. Deux heures de temps. 
We talked for two hours. Au téléphone. On the phone. Mais il ne m'a pas parlé de l'ampleur de sa maladie. But he never said anything about how serious il, his disease was. Parce qu'il voulait me protéger. Was, because he wanted to protect me. Maintenant, il est là. Le corps ne veut, ne veut rien dire. Now he's here. His body um, means nothing. Mais il a été reçu par Jésus-Christ. But he was received by Jesus. Le jour même Jesus. de son dernier souffle. On the last day of his last breath. Parce que son nom est écrit dans le livre de vie. Because his name is written in the book of life. Le jour il a donné sa vie au Seigneur. The day he gave his life to the Lord. La maladie, le corps, le corps des croyants périt par la maladie. Uh, I, uh, our bodies. Um, par la maladie. Mais, are destroyed by disease. Mais il, il ressuscitera. But he will, he will come back to life. Et à ce moment-là, il aura un corps glorieux. One day, and at that time, he will have force. a glorious body full ce of strength. Ce que nous devons savoir, c'est que la maladie, la souffrance et la mort ne viennent pas de Dieu. Uh, death. Nous savons tous Suffering and diseases don't come from the Lord. Nous savons que c'est la conséquence de la désobéissance de nos premiers parents uh, que la maladie that um, it's the disobedience of our first parents. La maladie, la mort est entrée dans l'homme. Diseases uh, upon man. Mais heureusement que nous avons un grand Dieu, un Dieu un Dieu plein d'amour. But luckily we have a great. Il a pensé à nous. Qui ne, qui a dit, great um, God who is full of love, who thinks about us, and he dit, says. Dans Jean 3, 16, in Dieu a John tant aimé le 3, monde, verse 16. Il a donné son fils. Uh, God gave his son. Afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse point. So that anyone who believes in him Mais will never la vie éternelle. perish. But will have eternal life. Aujourd'hui, nous devons célébrer la vie de Savary. Today, we should celebrate the life of Savary. Parce que Dieu lui a abrégé la souffrance. Because God has spared him of sufferance. Que Dieu vous bénisse. May God bless you. Julio Boyer, Julio Boyer. Savory and I are the youngest boys out of five. Our sister Mariange is number six. We try to make her a boy <laughs> so many times, but that never worked out. She always wanted to play with dolls, and we played with cars and trucks and built roads. He was Batman, and I was Robin. I can never forget the time he tackled a bully for me in the schoolyard at Notre Dame. The bully was shocked. He never saw it coming. And I was like, yes, got you. And ever since then, whenever that bully saw me, he ran the other way. I don't want nothing to do with this kid. We went on many secret missions together. I used to imagine I had his hair and looked exactly like him until some girl would rudely make me wake me up from dreaming. You don't look like him, okay? <laughs> Whenever we spoke over the phone, we'd speak for hours on end. We always reminisce about the time we hid behind boxes in our mother's grocery storage. We cut a hole in a box of five cent gum and we were competing to see who would chew the most gum. <laughs> the word cavities was not in our vocabulary. <laughs> he was around 13, I was around nine. We each had a pile of chewed up gum and wrappers. 
The rule was we had to chew the gum until we could make a bubble and move on to the next. Um, <laughs> our jaws got so sore and tired, <laughs> then we passed out. <laughs> they were looking for us. Thank goodness we were found by one of the helpers at the store and not our mother. <laughs> she promised not to tell if we cleaned up the mess we made. Our mother was always such a super detective and, and a pro uh, forensic profiler. She always knew who was capable of committing certain acts. If she interrogated us, I would have cracked on the spot. She always suspected it was the work of Savory and I, mostly I, because Savory was a saint like that. He could never do such a thing. But we never got a spanking for it. We, um, we got away with it for the rest of our lives. This brother mattered to me and many others, and a lot of you are here. This brother mattered. All my brothers matter. But I got to say this, Savory mattered most. <laughs> I'll always love you to infinity, Savory. We'll always be partners. <laughs> and we'll always be together. <laughs> always. I love you, brother. Well, Savory, Julio, and myself were three musketeers. And like Julio says, um, I was one of the guys. Up until I was 10 years old, my mother pulled my chain and said, you are a girl, and you're going to be my purse, and you're going to be hanging out with me a lot. So she pulled my chain about 10. <laughs> and um, I s then it ended up being that, um, you know, Fado and others were, you know, in college and doing, so it was just me, Savory, and Julio. But one thing I can say, Julio was my pest, and Savory was my angel. So Savory stood in the middle of the two of us and made peace. And as long as Savory was there, there was no problem. But the problem came when Savory came to the United States and left me and, you know, Julio together. <laughs> then that meant now we were <laughs> a problem. <laughs> But you know, I know we love each other. And um, later on in life, as we grew up, I, I asked Julio, I said, Julio, why is it that somehow we got along fine one moment, but another moment it looked like there was something that happened? And he said, well, the thing is, I was it. We had the five boys, and we were good. And then they brought a girl in the home. And, <laughs> and I was crying, and everybody was running to Marie, give her milk, give her this. And he just did not like the idea that I came, and I messed up his life. But. <laughs> Savory was the mediator, Savory was the connector, Savory was the glue. But later on in life, um, as we grew and as we loved one another more, you know, I thank God I have always been proud. I did not grow up with sisters. I've gained sisters in the church and the Lord. But I've always been proud to be able to tell bullies and everybody else. I have five brothers. You want to mess? I'm right here. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, God bless I'm gonna read a letter from Sarah. I love you, Daddy. You were the best dad ever. You were so kind, loving, always so happy. I really love your dad jokes, even though everyone else thought they were not funny. I miss playing Connect Four with you and letting you beat me in Uno. I love that you always listen to me. You're really understanding. Daddy, you are my hero. There's nothing that I can do without you. You will always be my hero. I though, although I know you are no longer suffering, and that you are with Jesus, I will miss you, and I will always love you forever. And that's Sarah. I'll be short and sweet. My dad. My dad had patience. Patience was his thing. 
he would wait for us, TJ Maxx. Wait for us, Hobby Lobby. Wait for us, Sam's Club. Wait for us, the mall. But what he's going to do, he was going to wait. And he waited with no complaining, and he just eat his snack and mind his business. And he would just wait. And then when it was his turn to go out, we had somewhere to go. My dad would teach us all how to drive, and he just jerking on the side of the highway, all of our breaking too hard. And then when we did, when he taught me how to drive, it was raining, and I ended up on the other side of the road. And then he was like, Nana, when you get a chance, just pull, you know, pull over to your right. And I was like, oh, why? He was like, you're on the side of the road. When I got there, I was like, uh, we're like, uh, like, uh, okay. And then we just, and he just moved on. There was no, like, panic. He just was patient with us. He taught us all to ride bikes. He taught us all how to not swim. He taught us, <laughs> he, he taught us when it came to painting, art, everything. He just, like, sat there and taught us all the details. When it came to learning how to do our cars, he sat there and told us all to change oil, how to check the oil. And then once we left, I forgot all the instructions, still came back for oil change. Everything he taught us, it was just, like, he was so patient with us. He taught us every morning, Saturday morning, he would get up, 8 o'clock in the morning, the lawnmower's running outside, and he's ready to cut the grass, then one of us come out there and cut the grass for him, or help cut the grass, it would be me or Tyler or whatever, and then he'd be like, nah, nah, you did a good job, but those lines, <laughs> those lines, and he would stay there watching me, and the lines would be back and forth, try, um, circle, they'd be all, all copyrighted, he'd be like, you know what, next time, next time, and the next time I come around, he'd be like, you take the backyard, I'll do the front, yeah. but he, but it was never, like, he, he always just was so patient with us, he was so, like, so kind about it, um, Oh, uh, sorry. Um, and then my dad, he was, he was always present. Like there was never a time, never a birthday party, never an art gathering, never a swimming class that we took. Cause my mom put us in it. Never, <laughs> there was never a certificate we didn't get from school. There was never graduation. There was nothing. He was never present for. We never had to ask where he was because he was always there. He was always just never absent, and even though the weight of the world was on him, we never felt the weight of the world, and he was just always there. And my dad loved. He loved us so much that made us love each other so much. He loved my mom obnoxiously oh, so yeah. much. I mean, we would go walking together, and we'd be in the car, 20 minutes past, they're still strolling, look at the building we saw 20 minutes ago, and holding each other's hand, and then we would leave the driveway, and he would call her, we're still in the driveway. And he would look, but it was like he loved my mom so much. And my mom, if he's, my mom's going, he's going. It was never like, it was like, oh, my husband's coming with me? It was like they wanted to do stuff together. And then it made us love each other so much more. My, God, my dad loved God so much. His faith. He taught us to love God. He taught us to pray. When we got sick and my dad would pray for us, the sleep we would have, oh my Lord, because we knew my, God, my dad prayed. Like, why am I going to sit? We would sleep. He would get up in his bed, pack all his covers and stuff, go lay in our bed, and we'll sleep in his bed at night, and we'll have the best night ever in the morning. But how do you feel? I'm like, I feel good. But like, how do you feel? He said, my back. I'm like, well, and it, and, but he was he was, he was just, he was just love God. His faith, he taught us to have faith as a mustard seed. And I know right now he's in heaven. All these remarks, he ain't listening to them because he's in heaven rejoicing. He's sitting down with his lawn chair, his mangoes, and his watermelon. And he has the angels cut his grass so straight. And he got to worry about none of us down here. And I am so happy for him. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> well... First, I'm going to start off with this note. I am the favorite daughter, so yeah. Um, <laughs> but my dad, like my sister was saying before, his patience was like just, I don't even know how to describe it. I would be at school for hours, just hours, just yapping my mouth to people. And he would sit there and wait from like, I think my class was like 8 o'clock in the morning to like 3 o'clock. And he would just be sitting there. He'd be like, I'm outside whenever you're ready. And I'm like... How are you just sitting there this long, just waiting for me? And, um, uh, when, well, uh, when I was younger, I did give my mom quite a hard time. I would throw Tampa tantrums. This is why I'm the favorite. Um, <laughs> I threw my mom like these terrible Tampa tantrums, and she'd give me the phone. I'd call my dad, and um, I would not get talking to like, oh, uh, 
you're gonna get in trouble when you get home. No, I got animal crackers. <laughs> like this was like the frosted animal crackers. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I would get oh, I was definitely spoiled. Um, but and it's okay because you know I'm still a favorite. So, um, <laughs> but last year I'm so happy. I for some reason I quit my job last year, and I got to spend all summer with my dad, and I don't regret not one day. Um, I got to just, we went like just everywhere. We went to Ann Arbor. We were just sitting there, just in the car, just yapping our mouths, just whatever. We can go on for days. And, um, yeah, we went to Georgia, went to New York. We were just like everywhere. And he was with me. And it was like, I would have never known that this year I wouldn't have my dad in the beginning of this year. But it was like, he was, he was there. He was every birthday, everything I had in life. He was there. He was at graduation. Just, just, I just love this man. Um, his jokes. I was the only one that really got them. Everybody like, what are you saying? That doesn't make no sense. Nothing. And me and my dad would be dying laughing like all over. Like, okay, nobody really got this. And then by the time you explain this to somebody else, it's not funny. So <laughs> the joke was over. <laughs> so, um, but. Um, Driving practice, I was the only one that did not really experience that, but it's okay. I got Tyler. So, um, but in, um, even in his last days, he, um, I was sitting in the room with him, and I don't know if anybody else is in there, but he had um, asked me, he was like, Nina? And I was like, yes. And he was like, how much do you need me on earth? And I was like, I need you. Like, you're, you're my dad. Like, you're my everything that I have. Like, that's all I know. But I was like, if God is telling you to, that this is your, your time is to go now, I was like, you take it and you run with it. I was like, don't worry about me here on earth. Yes, my heart will be broken because you are like my, that's my best friend. Like my dad was my best friend. I didn't need nobody else. It was just me, my dad, my mom, and Sarah. And we were, it was like we were our own friends. <laughs> but it, we were fine. And I was fine with that. I was fine with hanging out with my dad for hours, just yapping, asking him questions that didn't make sense to me. And um, we never got to look up our questions, but it's okay. Um, but even just in, well, when he was sick, we would read our favorite book. I would read a book to him every night, and it was just so amazing. But I want to let everybody know I love my dad, and he got to tell me that he loved me before he even died. And that touched me so much. But I love you, Dad, and just like I told you, I'm going to see you again, even if it takes one day at a time. I will work as hard as I get, and I will see you again. Okay, well, I'm the favorite daughter because I'm the first daughter, so. <laughs> I was the daughter slash son because Tyler was right in the middle, so he was younger, so I was the daughter slash son. So I got to experience the fast driving, the cars, um, when it came time to fixing other people's cars, I was right outside with my dad. He would go in the house, where's these alley? I'm outside helping fix cars, changing the oil, changing tires. I knew how everything in the car was supposed to operate before I started driving, and I was his only daughter that he taught how to drive a stick shift, so I, I got that privilege. Um, my dad was, um, with the, I have a quick car story. With my father, he always fixed our cars. He always, you know, make sure we were on or update our oil checks, our tires, and everything like that. So he was our mechanic. But last year, I, no, two years ago, I purchased a vehicle. And then last year, I just, you know, needed some checks and stuff on the car. So I called my dad and I'm like, Daddy, the car is making this sound. I just need to check it, update it. And he was like, Well, you know, you're going to have to, you know, just go to a mechanic. And I was like, I looked at my phone. I'm like, Did he say what I'm like? Like, you are the mechanic. That's why I called you. And I felt so offended. Like, what? And then so he's like, Call the mechanic, you know, go check it out. So then I took it to the dealership where I had gotten it from. And then he's like, hand them the phone. And he spoke to them. He's like, this is what's wrong with it. Don't look at nothing else. Make sure this is fixed. And he made sure everything was in detail. And when I left, I didn't have to pay a penny because my dad made sure he spoke to them. And the guy on there was like, he said, I don't know who that man is on the phone. I'm like, that's my dad. That's who you're talking to. <laughs> but that's just how he was. And like Suri talked about his patience. The way he was with my mom, my father, he cared so much about my mother and how even as us children treated my mom, if my mom, he was very aware. If my father felt like my mom was having a stressful day, whatever it was, he would wake up early Saturday morning, eight o'clock in the morning, everybody get up, get your swim clothes, get your um, fishing gear, grab all the stuff, we would go grab snacks, all that stuff. He would take us 
all day long and spend time with us and make sure that my mom had her time and never was like, oh, you know, you got, nope. He made sure that my mom had her time and he spent time with us. He was very, like Sarah said, present in our lives. There was never a time where I'm like, oh, like I wish my dad was what There's nothing that I can say that I lacked from my father because he, he did that. He was there. He was that man in our lives. Um, my, my father, and he never complained about spending time with us. It wasn't like, oh, I got to watch the kids today. No, you're my children. Come with me. Like, that's how my dad was. And he would come home. If he, if he came home from long days of work, he would walk in the house, and then he'd be like, you know what? I'm like, you know, that mom's not feeling well. He would pass all of us, go upstairs, check on my mom, close the door, come downstairs. And I'm like, you know, daddy is not ready. He's like, okay, we all know, I know how to cook. We know how to make food. Let's get in the kitchen and make something. Your mom needs to rest. Like, that's how my dad was. He was never complaining about anything. He... He acted in every, any moment, any time there was something, he just, let's, let's fix it. Okay, let's figure it out. I had a, a birthday one year, and I remember I was like crying. So I'm like, oh my gosh, we're on vacation. It's like storming outside. There's nothing. He gathered all of us and said, everybody, go put your, your wet clothes on that you need to get wet in. We'll go outside. And we had the best soccer game in the rain outside. And that was my dad. And we had fun. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is, my dad, as far as family, doesn't stop past these reserve seats. I'm just looking out in the crowd and everyone, my dad considered everyone as family. He loved, ev deeply loved everyone dearly. And we were so grateful just to see everybody. I mean, if my dad saw everybody here, he's like, what, for me? Everybody's there for me? And that's just who he was. He was, he was just loved by everyone and he loved everyone. So we appreciate everyone coming. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to be the one that's strong for them, but. <laughs> I know, uh, you know, everybody says, you know, it's, uh, how are you doing with being the only boy in the house and stuff, but. That wasn't just my dad, that was my brother. <laughs> he didn't just treat me like a dad. And <sighs> it is, like my sister just said, you know, there's no like point of our life that he was not there and not present. And just from younger, I mean, it's so many stuff. I can't remember the countless like uh, trips we've been on just fishing trips and camping trips and I know like the Borns, Austin, Ian and myself we would you take them with us and be on these trips like all the time and there's a I know one time I think one specific that still stuck out to me that we went and uh, it was I think it was like a three day camping trip and it was like the whole planet it was a bunch of people that was there but the whole planet was just like you only thing you can bring with you like to tent food clothes everything you get to carry on your back for like three days so we had he went and did it and it was like freezing just like winter just starting and we're sleeping in a tent and didn't complain he was right there with me it was the most miserable trip ever <laughs> but it was like the best one that i've ever had on top of that and just like i said going through that time and, and just and the, the stuff like I said about the cars and stuff, and that's and I know most people know about me. I'm like I love cars as well, and always into it, and you know would drive a suggested speed limit. And uh, <laughs> my uh, my dad and I, you know, he we would that's like kind of our bonding thing. We'd always be outside, you know, just doing something with the car. Like it's something that we're fixing because it's something that I broke as usual what happened. And uh, <laughs> um. Every time, you know, say I got a new vehicle, I got it, and it's like, he was like, all right, make sure you keep this one good. And I'm like, next week, and I did something to change it up. I was like, I'm gonna make it a little faster, or something like that, and then next week, it's broke after that. <laughs> so, it's, we spent so much time together. First time ever swapping the engine out. My dad was right there, showed it with me the first time. I mean, all that different stuff, and, and I remember, it's actually, it was two specific times. So one is, my dad, we were working on a, a vehicle, so it, this is kind of like, He's talking a lot of stuff, but he never did it intentionally. It was, it was very nice, but it, it's just always a sweet reminder within me that, like, 
that he gave me. Like, I didn't really know anything, you know? So I was like, and not, not he didn't say that to me, but just by him showing his experience, I realized I didn't know anything. So we were sitting there, we were changing out. Uh, it was, I'm not going to say the part in the car because some people here might be like, that was pretty simple. But I was trying to change it out and uh it was not coming off like i sat there like mid-afternoon and i'm just working i'm working i'm like he's like okay he said we'll try to use this or whatever he came out there had his little you know cup and little you know peanut butter sandwich in his hand (laughs) walking outside and he just looking at me and he's like getting it off he squats down right looking at me like as if he's wearing the car he didn't touch anything but he's just watching there he's like all right try this get that he's like he's not coming on he's okay so i was like well i'm gonna try this i'm gonna run over here i keep back and forth running the store grabbing new tools trying to get this thing off it's just not coming off it is pitch black outside at this point I've been there all day on that one part trying to pull that thing off and it's dark I can't see nothing I have a little flashlight propped up on the car and I went in the house it was at the point to where I was like okay I don't have no idea what to do so I got there I'm sitting on the on the step and my mom came and she was like what's wrong I was like I said I'm trying to fix my car I was like I can't do it I don't know what to do anymore it's not coming off and then she went talk to my dad she was she went talk to him and uh she was like, hey, she said, um, Tyler, you know, can't get this stuff off. He was like, okay. He said, I'll be out there in a second. And he came out there, and he was like, oh, he said, uh, he said, hey, try this. He grabbed it. She came right off, like nothing. And I was like, you watched me all day, <laughs> and you could have came out there, and you could have helped me do this. And you watched me struggle. Like, you came out there like five times and checked on me, and you never did you offer to help me. And he knew how to get out the whole time and just didn't say nothing to me. So... And then there's another specific situation is he was, we were uh, working on something. It was, he's adjusting the timing on a van that we had. And it was, I was pretty young. And, you know, I'm trying to get my hands dirty and stuff, whatever. So he's, he's doing it. And he was trying to, there's one of the pulleys that he was going to, like, you know, he had to replace it. So he was like, he got it just where he wanted to. And he was like, okay, I'm going to fix this. But he said, I got to get the right thing because if I mess it up, I got to replace like, all this stuff. So I was like, okay, no problem. So he walked in the house. And I was like, I'm gonna see if I can pull it off or something like that. So, you know, I'm wrestling, trying to get it off, and I broke it. And I was like, no. So I was so torp inside, because I knew he was doing it. I was like, either I tell him or I don't tell him. So then I was like, he's gonna find out. I gotta tell you something to him. So I just it was the right thing to do. So I went and said something to him, and I knew how long he'd been working on this and how critical it was, and how much work he's gonna do to fix it. And he came out there, and I showed him, and he looked at it, and all he said was, he said, hey, he said, if. You just be patient. If you wait until we use the right tool for the job, he said, you go avoid a lot of trouble later. Just make sure you ask next time. That's all he said to me. And I was like, I was expecting him, like, whoa. And I was like, wow, okay. So I just remember that. I'm like, man, he was, like, so patient. He taught me. He never, you know, streamed or anything. And, and like I said, the, the part where they say he never was out of our lives, I've never had any type of school event, like graduation. I've never had any type of track event that he wasn't at to. I never had any like outside thing that he didn't show up and go with me and participate. Like it was always there every single time. And we were my senior year of co- uh, college or high school. I was playing a soccer team. I was like, we we're getting playoffs as far as we've ever been. So we we're about to get to the States. And I remember there was a game that we had to win. You know, versus private school, it was nighttime and lights and everything. I was sitting there, and it was not even any around here. It was out of town, like a long drive. So we had left. Wasn't expecting my family, but my dad never not showed up. So I remember he's always told me when we go to the games, he was like, hey, he said, like, you know, this is all a mental game. He said, you know, your team might say, like, oh, they're better than us, everything. But he said, if you say that, you're going to lose. You can't lose the game before you get there. So I remember that. So I got there. <clears throat> And there was only a few of us who had, like, played, so they were kind of, like, relying on a few of us. So I'm playing there, and I just remember it was, like, all game. I didn't see him. I kind of couldn't really see him in the stand. It was nighttime. But I was playing, and I don't know why. For some reason, it, it was it, like, not that – there was very – few minutes left in the game, and the score is 0-0, and we're playing hard. Everybody's, like, just gone. So I remember, for some reason, I just looked over the fence, and I seen some little headlights. And – I just, I just remember seeing my dad sitting and leaning on the car to watch me. And at that moment, it just, you would have thought like I just started playing the game. I just felt like everything come back in me. And it was like a few minutes after that, I ended up scoring and that was the game winning point that we got. That we won it.
and it just shows like the power of heaven dead in your life that's there and and I remember so much, like even like Father's Day would come here and, you know, the, you know, they'd preach about, you know, dads and like, you know, just be encouraging about dads being coming here. And we'd hear all this stuff all the time in, in school. And I remember sitting in the classroom with a bunch of us students in one area and then is our art class. And there were every single one of them was going back and forth. I know I got the conversation. They're talking about their parental situation. And I was the only one out of this big group of people who said that my parents were still together and said that my dad was still in my life. And I just remembered that, and he has stuck with that. My dad was never in and out of the church. He was never in and out of the house. He was never in and out of our lives. I never seen him argue with us, argue with my mom. He never yelled at us, yelled at my mom. He never did any of that stuff. He was a proper example of how a man was supposed to be. And he didn't like start off that way and end like we, he was that way his entire life. And there's not a single point in my life that I can think of that my dad didn't live right the way a man is supposed to be. All those stuff that they talk about, examples, or all the stuff they say is it should be this way. That's what my dad was. And I've seen it for myself. And I lived with him my entire life. And I've never seen anything different. And I appreciate it. I'm going to miss him. So thank you. This guy right here had a special way of having a special impact on everybody individually. It's like he was able to stretch himself to where he had a very unique experience with each and every individual, no matter where he was. And uh, I can attest to that, that speed that he's driving at, because I remember there's a trip that he took us from New York down to Florida and to this day, I can't, I can't recreate that, that time he took to get there. It was, it was real fast. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, but he's had a very, he's had a very big impact on my life. Uh, allowed me to spend a lot of time with him, taking me in, been a father figure to me. And uh, I sat down last night to write something, but. There isn't, there's enough words to describe the impact. The, the positive example that he sets is not just by his words, but by his actions. He might not say a lot, but he will create the space for you to do the right thing. And if he sees you kind of going off, he will sit your side and spend some time with you and say, this is how you do it. This is how, this is how it's supposed to go. And, you know, give you, the, give you the space to kind of stumble, but he'll be right there every time. He won't let you fall. He'll be right there, reliable. If you think he's not watching, he's somewhere watching. And he's looking and he's paying attention. And when you need him most, he's right there for you. So thank you all for coming. We're going to just sing a couple of songs that were my dad's favorite songs. Um, and the first one that we're singing is one that he sang to each of us every night before we went to bed.
I am so overwhelmed with joy just to see all of these faces. First, I'll say what my husband would say. Welcome to his party. <laughs> um, think, I want to thank each and every one of you that showed up to help us at this moment. It means so much to us. I'll try to be very quick. I've known my husband for 40 years. We were high school sweethearts. Not recommending that any of you do that. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> but um, we met in high school the same year that he came from Haiti. And I actually was there to kind of help him, you know, because there was a language barrier. Savvy was my best friend. And we were, honestly, we were just friends. Um, we would spend numerous, as the years got, you know, went on, it became more, we'd spend numerous hours talking on the phone. Back then, they did not have an unlimited long distance plan. So you can imagine what the phone bills were like. Um, I'll say two things that Savvy did. Savvy was very fearless, and he took a lot of chances. So while I was in college, one day I was coming out of my class, and I have to say I had a very strict mother, extremely strict mom. And um, she kept it in the home in such a way that when Savvy would come over, it's like my sister would have to sit on, Savvy had to sit on one side, I sat on the other side, and my sister's in the middle. middle. And I think that's how we all got so close because anywhere we went, we were never allowed to be alone. My sisters were there with us. So, but it built such a bond, so, um, and it never bothered him. He just kept coming back, coming back. And, um, but one day I'm coming out of my class in college and open the door and there's Savvy sitting on the floor behind the door. I'm like, the reason why I was bewildered is because Savvy did not go to my school. He somehow, in the streets of Manhattan, got a fake ID to my college. <laughs> he was at my college so much that my peers, I mean, it was like he was, in the school. And that continued until we graduated. Um, Savvy was someone who liked to have fun. So I'm the one that more strict. My children would say he was a fun parent because he was laid back and just made things fun. I'm the one that was more shy and to myself. And Savvy was the one that was like the life of the party. And I can go on and on. But all of these attributes got used to mesh us. We had such a balance, and it just worked so well. And I thank God for that. Savvy was my actual knight in shining armor. He was my hero. Um, it seemed like anything that happened in my life, Savvy was somehow there to rescue me. And I'll give one example, not in detail, but there was a situation that happened when I went to visit New York, um, my parents in New York one time, and it was a pretty potentially dangerous situation, and it was not nice. Remember, when I went to my mom's, I was upstairs, and, um, and I was praying. I'm like, only if Savvy was here. If only Savvy was here. Sometime later that night, it was pretty late, and my mom comes in, I think my children, and there was Savvy right behind them. And I'm like, it's like he just pop up. Savvy just pop up when something went wrong. And I'm like, I was just so elated, so happy. And I said, well, Savvy, I don't understand. How did you get here? It's like, it's late. I have the only car that can actually make it to New York. How did you get here? Well, my wonderful husband said, he went to Craigslist. He found someone who was traveling to New York. <laughs> and the only deal was that he had to pay half the ride. I'm like, you did what? You could have gotten killed. And it was someone from somewhere, some other country, I don't know where. But I said, but Savvy, you could have gotten killed. But his only response was that he knew that I needed him. And it didn't matter what risk he had to take. It's like, I'm going to be there. It's like he sensed it. And that's who Savvy was. And everything that everybody said, I'm not going to repeat it because it was a lot. Savvy was all that and more. He was my best friend more than anything else. And I think that's what made our relationship work so well. We were friends more than anything else. And then being saved on top of that? Oh, I mean, it was just wondering. I, I think of like, it's like you have, like you're doing a braid 
and you have three strands and you tie it and you put God in between. That's how we endeavor to have our relationship, having God entwined in everything we did. And because of that, we face some very, very hard situations in our lives. Situations that could have had us split apart. Situations that could have been like, I could like, you know what, forget this. But not one time, it doesn't matter what we went through, and some of you know what we went to. Not one time did I ever feel like, you know what, I'm done. No, that's my husband. I loved him, and you know what? We all have our highs, we all have our lows. We were able to do it together. And I thank God so much for that. My husband was just very patient. I don't have that kind of patience. <laughs> my children know, if I said we're leaving at a certain time, you have to be there or else. But with him, it's like it didn't matter. And I pray that I possessed that type of patience like he did. But I relied on him for everything. Um, it seemed to me that there's nothing that he, he couldn't do. It's like, Sister Juanita used to sing a song like Keith, Keith, something like that. If no one can, I know he can. I used to be like, Savory, no, she doesn't understand. It's you, you know? But I just enjoyed being Savory's wife. I feel honored to be called Sister Boyer. I feel honored to be part of his life. I'm honored that I had a man that took care of his children. Not one time did I have to worry about anything. Yes, things may have been hard or whatever, but some way, somehow, I knew because my husband loved God and because of his faith, that we can pray, it would work out. Somehow it would work out. And I thank God for that. I thank God for the experience. 40 years is a very long time. 40 years is a very long time. But you know what? I just thank God. He was my biggest cheerleader, and I was his biggest cheerleader. Anywhere I went, Savvy was there, and vice versa. And I just... If I had an advice to give to anybody right now that's married or plans to be married, don't sweat the small stuff. Because you know what? This will come one day for one of you. Do not sweat the small stuff. It's not worth it. When my husband got sick and he was unresponsive, if the Lord chose to take him at that time, I would have had no regrets. I could not have said, well, I wish, oh, I did this. No, no regrets. I prayed and I'm like, Lord, let him come back because I just wanted one more opportunity to kind of look at him and just, just to talk, just to hear him. And God allowed that. And we had even more because he was able to say his goodbyes. He was able to, I mean, you don't hear that. It's like Lord brought him back that we can say goodbyes. He was able to say goodbye to his family and he gave us instructions. He let us know how he felt about us. And, and it's like there was closure there. Maybe God knows that I, I was one of those that can just go like that. I don't know. But I thank God for doing for that, that for me, and all of us. Because a lot of the saints reap that benefit as well. Um, my husband was a giant in my eyes. And I guess that's all that mattered, in my eyes. To me, it's like he was just, to live life without him, 40 years, it's like, my children said, Mommy, you look lost. Not in a spiritual sense, in a human sense. Yes, I look very lost because it seemed like, I mean, Savvy was everything to me. But you know what? I thank God for salvation. I thank God because I know where he's at. Because I know where he's at, it gives me a consolation to go on and to keep going on so I could make it where we at. Yes, I'm, I cry a lot. Yes, but today I feel like it's a celebration of his life because I saw him go through things that a lot of people did not go through. I saw him just be hurt and so forth, but you know what? He kept on, and as a family, we had his back, and I thank God for that opportunity, and I thank God even more for having God in my life because there's no way within myself that I could be standing here just even this morning, I'm like, I tried to write something and it's like, I'm not even reading from it. I'm like, Lord, because of you, I have that consolation. And I think if you don't have him in your life, you might want to give him a try because God will put something in your soul that he'll give you a strength. Now, most people that know I'm more of the one that cries. I'm the one that might be like, 
God has given me such a boldness in him, I may not be able to talk about anything else. But when it comes to my salvation, when it comes to the life that God has given me, my children and my husband, I will gladly proclaim it. I thank God for being saved. I thank God for Sammy Boyer. I thank God for being his wife. I thank God for everything, everything our life. I thank him for the good times we had, and I thank him even for the worst situation that may have happened. I thank him because you know what? In those situations, I even learned about myself. I learned maybe things that I needed to change about myself. Sometimes things happen in marriage. Don't always look at the other person. Sometimes it might be you. You might be able to take something out of it to grow. So I just thank God so much. I just, I'm just so excited and I thank God that's not the way I'm supposed to go, but I thank God and thank you all for coming. You know what? I thank God for teaching me, my husband, and my children how to hold on. I thank God we held on. selection but hey man we have an interjection should I say but the Savory's mother the mother that produced this giant of a man praise God Good afternoon, everybody. Merci, nous vini la pour vini aider moi. She said, "Thank you for coming to being here to help her." Avec famille moi. With the family. Parce que toute petite moi est là. Because all her children are here. Except Savory. Except Savory. But I hope. She hoped that God would give her the time to be with him later on in life. S'il vous plaît, priez en pile pour Cynthia. Please pray a lot for Cynthia. And our family. And our family. Merci pour venir nous venir. Thank you for coming for coming. Parce que des monde qui quitte travail yo. There's a lot of people who left their jobs. A lot of people who came from afar from Florida. Tampa. Tampa. Okay, merci, merci. Thank you, thank you very much. God bless you. And God bless you. Bye. <laughs>
hero and I sure don't have the answers but I held on till the storm was over not because I'm good not because I'm great not because I'm strong I just Things are finally happening. I've got blessings, thank God I can call them my own. There were so many times I wondered how I would make it. But while I was wondering, I just kept on holding on. Is there a poem? <laughs> um, hey guys, <laughs> I'm so thankful for my uncle Savory. Like everybody said, he he took the time out for everybody. Like, and I appreciate even though we were far. He came and like spent time with us. And I'm appreciative like of each and every single one of you guys. Thank you. Um, but I have a poem um, written by Anissa Gaskin. His name was Savory, not Savory or Savory. <laughs> so let's get that part straight. <laughs> um, a fun, loving, fun and loving father, son, brother, uncle, friend, and soulmate. He was so laid back and funny without a lazy bone about him. A self-taught observer, a true industrious gem. Optimistic and encouraging for those who needed a giggle. Endeavoring from the truth to never squirm or wiggle. He taught his son and daughters his industrious tricks. His wife was his best friend, they just clicked. Savory loved all members of his family, whether they were blood or not. Always a call away to help others out a lot. 
So weep not, for we know he is at peace. Today we are not saying goodbye, but see you soon. We have a musical selection. Before we do, we'll read the scripture. In Acts 11, 24 says for he was a good man full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord then departed Barnabas it said that Barnabas was a good man brother Boyer was was a good man There's a natural way to process that, and then there's a spiritual way. From a natural perspective, he was impeccable, as well as a spiritual. Eulogy, the Greek word, is eulogia, and it's a commendatory oration in honor of deceased given at one's funeral. Brother Boyer preached his own funeral. You know when a person proclaimed their own funeral when there are themes that are shared consistently. His childhood friends to his siblings to the saints to his extended family, they all proclaimed a similar theme. <clears throat> Never caused his mother any problems. She didn't have to bail him out of jail or get involved. Penal system, drugs, alcohol, children throughout. To his siblings, they could count on him, no strife. They were all commending Brother Boyer at the highest level in every conversation. Brother Wagner did have to give him a spanking when he was little. Praise the Lord, Brother Wagner. <laughs> well, I thought it was just him, but then I think it was Guardy and uh, Julio said, or Julio said, it wasn't only Brother Boy or Savory that he gave. He said, Brother Wagner was like a father to all of us. My mother gave him that authority. So we appreciate you, Brother Wagner, handling that authority at such a high level. Darren, you didn't mention that the speeding ticket that you got, Brother Boyer helped pay it. What type of friend help a friend pay for a speeding ticket? Good man. Loyal, kind, giving. loved his daughters. He was a daddy's a father of daughters. Loved his daughters so much, sometimes he would be on the phone with them, Sister Boria would say, who you on the phone with? He cared so much. Loved his son. When he came back, 
he was speaking to some people regarding Tyler. And I'm not certain if Tyler overheard or someone related, but he said that everything I desired Tyler to do, he did. When a father can say that, and Tyler, I'll add and say, and then some. And then some. It's nothing that Brother Boer, none of the seeds that he planted went to waste. None fell to the ground. The mantle's on you, but you're prepared for this hour. You're prepared for this hour. It's one of the toughest programs in all of the county, in fact, this, area, this part of the nation, very hard to get into. They were trying to reach out to the college officials and ask us to recommend certain people that had the academic acumen as well as the intellect and the physical wherewithal to get into the program. They couldn't find matches. They find someone that had the intellect, but they didn't have the physical wherewithal. They didn't have the stamina. They found some that had the stamina, but didn't have the intellect. One of the only ones in this area of the U.S. to make it through the program, one of the highest paying, I, mean, I better be careful, sisters are hearing me. <laughs> Positions, amen. But the Tyler made it through and it's thriving. Your father was so, so proud of you. You know, there is Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. There's Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier of Monaco. There's Romeo and Juliet. There's JFK and Jackie. There's Cliff and Claire Huxtable. There's Martin and Coretta. There's Michelle and Barack. For you younger people, there's LeBron and Savannah. There's Kobe and Vanessa. There's Jay-Z and Beyonce, but for us, but for us, but for us, there was Savory and Cynthia, we thank you. Sister Boyer, you more than honored your vows. Every step of the way, you were there. And Sister Boyer, one of the things that you did that was so powerful as a man, you got to step up and you have to be this, that, and the other. But you don't understand the quality and the caliber of wife or spouse that you have until everything don't go right. Until your back gets against the wall. Until you slip up a little bit. And those are times in which you could be crushed. Those are times in which your manhood can be exposed. But those are times in which you step up and defended him the most. Those are times in which you stood in there. Those are times in which you didn't let the children know what you all were dealing with to make sure that his manhood and his honor stayed at the highest level. Sister Boyer, we applaud you. You are all of that. You and then some. What a spouse. What a wife. And I thought that Brother Boy was a strength, and I thought that he was a strong one. They said, he said, Cynthia's so quiet, meek, and speak, this, that, and the other. But oh, when it comes down to the rubber meeting the road, when it comes down to the gospel, when it comes, I'm like, oh, get a protection. Oh, you ain't got to protect her. <laughs> when, the, when, the, when, we, when the real war started, Sister Boyer was the one. The children, he told you all to pray and taught you all faith. Fasted seven days, the golden coin, you know. But you know you reap what you sow. He taught you all faith. So when he was at the end, and he needed inspiration to get over Jordan, yeah. I get the call, not the church, seven day fast. I said, who, what, who doing what, what, who doing a seven day fast for Brother Boy? Who doing what, what? His children went on a seven day fast to make sure that daddy made it over. Now I come in and I'm sitting here and I'm talking to them and I'm sitting here like, okay, we gotta pray, we gotta get the church involved, we gotta come on, raise him up, God bless before we gotta. They said, oh no, oh no. I said, but boy, let's go. He said, no, Billy, I'm going to heaven. I said, what? Hold on, whoa, 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 God ain't showed me that. Hold on, we, we need warriors. Don't leave. Like, you don't leave. Everybody can't go. Take me with you, please. What the world is all that's going on? No. Then the children stepped up and said, oh, no. 
He's going. He's going. And I'm sitting. They said, brother, you don't understand. We, we, this is what we prayed and fasted for. He's ready. Don't leave him here to mess up. He done made it. He, he ready. He's situated. And this is a Cynthia said, well, praise the Lord. Amen. This family, remarkable personal experience in faith. Yeah. Now, I could just close it with this. Came to this world as a free moral agent. Had to make a decision. Made a decision to give his heart to God. And let me just say this. Brother Boyer advocated and proclaimed. There's no way he let all this come and not advocate and proclaim for salvation. Not religion, but salvation. Yes. And there's a difference. Yes. He's been interviewed. They asked him. They said that, man, I know a lot of people. They go and they get drunk and they fornicate and they do this and they, they go to church on Sunday and this in the choir and they're preaching and they're doing this and that. But boy, he said, oh, no, that's not salvation. That's religion. Salvation, you don't do that stuff. You're saved. Yeah. Because you repented and put your faith in Jesus. Amen. Come on now. Amen. You got to put your faith in Jesus. Yes. Brother Boyer proclaimed it. You said, Brother Lee, well, I don't believe in Jesus. I believe in Buddha. I believe in this. I believe in that. I'm not disrespecting that. All I'm going to tell you is this. Is that you have to have an atonement. Yes. <laughs> when you stand before God, somebody has to atone for your sin. And only one person died on that cross. Amen. Only one person died on that cross. And that's who he placed his faith in. And he desired all of us. And he repented from his sin. Yeah, but Darren, he was down at the clubs. Yeah, he was doing this, that, and the other. But when he got saved, amen, he walked in the new way of life. Thank the Lord he wasn't in the clubs no more. Thank the Lord he was, amen, going forth for Jesus. Amen. He wasn't walking on both sides of the track. You can't be a saint and a sinner at the same time. You won't make it to heaven. The Bible said, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. But the boy wants to see you again, but you got to live right to see him again. You got to put your faith in Jesus to see him again. Jesus said, if you go your way, I'm going my way. But if you die in your sins, don't you let no false theology. Amen. Grace don't cover sin. Grace gives you strength. Amen. To live a holy life. The blood covers sins. Come on now. He said, many going to say that day, Lord, I did this. Lord, I did that. Lord, I did the other. He's going to say, hold on, depart from me. I never knew you. What knew there means the same Hebrew word. that said Adam knew Eve. Amen. There's an intimacy God cannot have with sinners. It can't happen. Yes, he loves you, but something is between. There's a great God. There's, a, there's something between you. God, light can't fellowship darkness. you got to go through Jesus to be reconciled back to God so you can be one with him. And when you're one with him, you can pray to him and he'll bring you through. You don't need to go through to a priest or a pope or anybody else you can go directly to the throne of grace as brother Boyer did because he was holy and he was righteous and he made it to the other side and he wants us to make it to the other side as well this is a eulogy from this perspective I got saved I was born was a good son good sibling Got saved, went through some things, very meek. And let me just say, one of the most non judgmental people I've ever met in my life. And that's a quality that's hard to, but also strong on his convictions. They, they, they invited, they, they, they gave him some weed. Brother Boyer, they said, hey, Savory, here's some weed, bro. He said, no, I'm good. They said, no, 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 here, smoke this weed, smoke this weed. He was in some club, they said, smoke this weed. He said, no, I don't travel in that lane. If you feel too, that's you. But I don't travel in that lane. Then they start talking about him. Dog. He said, you don't understand, man. I'm good. Now, I'm not judging you. But don't try to change me. That's right. Wow. That's right. Smoke your weed. Do what you do. But don't try to change me. You, you feel to travel in that lane. Travel in that lane. I'm not judging you. I hope it works out for you in the end. But don't try to change me. Don't talk about me. Don't dog me out the same way you want me to respect your convictions. Respect mine. Brother Boyer, that caliber of man, God saved, non judgment, humble, meek, lowly, well, gets married, high school sweetheart. I recommend you pray it through. <laughs> but God had mercy. Amen. But, 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 but lo loved his wife. Gave her all that he could. 
had a house full of children. One he's with up in glory. Amen. All of his children saved. Go down the list. Gave their lives to God. I thought, who got saved in California? Christina? Yeah, I thought Christina is so meek and nice. I thought she were in California a few weeks ago. Somebody went to the altar. I looked at who's that? Christina, I want to be saved. All his children saved. God brought him back. He says, me and my wife on one accord. My life is in order. All my children are saved. Lord, come get me. And God said, and God said, here I come. Now all we have to do is make it to the other side yes. to see the family reunion that he so desired. Family, you all did above and beyond. Yes. Even when his faith was low. He didn't call for the ministry. People said, the ministry this bit. He didn't call for the ministry. His children came, met in the office, and said, Brother Lee, he's going through and his faith is low. He taught us. He stood. This, that, yeah, this, we, we were praying. We gonna fight. God built him, strengthening bought him clean through. And children, you have this. Everything your father taught you, everything he stood on, he never bagged up from. You don't ever have to worry about confusion. You don't ever have to worry about anything. And the Bible says, walk in the light as he's the light. Light is spiritual understanding. But the boy stood for every bit of truth that he ever proclaimed to you all. That's solid. Yes. That's solid. You can bank on that. We'll see him on the other side if we hold on to what he showed us. Every head is bowed. Father, we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness. Barnabas was a good man. Brother Boyer was a good man. Not just in word, but in deed. We thank you for loaning Father 57 years. He gave us all that he could. He was a son to his mother. Father, brother to his siblings, a great relative to all his relatives. His in-law said he's more like a natural brother or son than an in-law. The in-law said, good man. Father, dear God, he was a husband par excellence. A father, go-karts, mini bikes, trips, fishing, boats, uh, uh, how to fast, how to pray, balanced games, just a father at the highest level. We thank you for the life of Savory Boyer. We ask the Lord that you wrap your arms around Sister Boyer right through here. Yes. Father, yes. grant her what she needs. Grant her that inspiration. We can all come together right now, but we're going to go home. Yes. Father, in the sermon that she just preached, yes. Father dear God, may we grab hold of that. We pray, dear Lord, you'd help us to adhere to everything that she mentioned. Thank you, dear God, for this family. Thank you, dear Lord, for these children. Lord, may they rest assured in knowing Daddy made it home. Now we have to get there as well. We commit this family to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. How Hampton Place. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the services here at the church for Mr. Boyer. And in just a few moments, we'll be making our way to the cemetery. And for the sake of time, we've been asked to request that all of you please remain seated. Those that will be passing by the casket will be the family. And you'll have some time together before we make our way to the cemetery. And then Cynthia has asked that we allow her to close the casket, which I think is very appropriate because of the hope and the assurance that we have in knowing where he's at, amen, to be absent from the body, the scripture says, to be present with Christ so we know where he's at today. So we will do what we need to do respectfully in honoring him. And then following our time at the cemetery, you're all invited back here to the church where you'll share in a meal together and as you sit across the table sharing in some good food, I know the fellowship and conversation will be just as good and just as sweet as you share the stories of how your life has been touched and influenced by Mr. Boyer. 
As you do that, would you be quick to thank God, recognizing that he has been so good to all of us and allowing his life to be a part of yours. Just give thanks to God for that. As we conclude our time here together, those that are assisting as casket bearers and those that are assisting as honorary casket bearers will ask for you to wait for us in the foyer area of the church and we'll be bringing Mr. Boyer to you and we'll use your assistance at that time. So as we begin, we're going to ask Angela's going to dismiss the family. Please, the others, please hold your seats and you will follow us out row by row as we exit. Thank you for your understanding and continue to hold this family in your thoughts and prayers.
at the sanctuary. We will need to make our ways to the cars just as quickly as we're able to because the cemetery has a time frame that they're asking us to be there by. Shouldn't be a problem at all if we move directly to our cars and then following that time you'll come back and visit with the family over the lunch. We hope your schedule will permit that. For those that are assisting as flower bearers, would you please make your way this way? There are a couple of people flower bearers if you'd come this way and then casket bearers and honorary casket bearers will wait for us in the foyer area as we leave we will go to the doorway and we'll call for your assistance at that time thank you Father, but by me. Now, if Jesus risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, for since by man cometh death, also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so Christ shall all be made alive. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall it be brought to pass the saying that is written, 
Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. Thanks be unto God. He's always given us up the victory. Man. 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 Man.